Okay. <coughs> then we <coughs> start this lecture on transport and spatial structure with focus on urban structures. I have uh, been one week on on the road and uh, after that I ended up with a flu. So this lecture may perhaps be a bit short, but uh, I think we'll cover the main points here anyway. Uh, and some some of the lecture I, I is kind of inspired by by the trip that I had to to Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. Uh, with a stopover in in, uh, in New York on the way down there, uh, and that was indeed two different urban structures, New York and uh, Atlanta. I'll try to tell you a bit about that as we move along. Um, there are, I will now go through some ways of categorizing urban structures. Um, uh, this, is, this is actually really important because most of the population worldwide today live in cities. And there are substantial challenges connected to urban development. And you have seen that uh, from the places that you, you, you originate from, be it Molde, this small little town here, or Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, for instance, might be two extremes in this uh, in this space. Uh, and there are lots of types of urban design, um, and the common denominator for them is that they have a quite large amount of path dependency. I think I mentioned path dependency last time. Uh, because the way you start out with a, with a type of, uh, let's say, urban design will be a rather strong determinant for where you end up. Or you never end up, but the way it develops. And I will try to, to s elaborate a bit on, on that as, as we move along. But this is uh, <coughs> one way of, of uh, categorizing, and you will see from, in a lot of, uh, let's say, presentations of categories, we often use a two times two table or panel matrix. Here we have centralized, decentralized structures, and we have clustered and dispersed in terms of um, population and job density. Here, the centralized structure <coughs> is quite dense. Uh, we can uh, consider these as, uh, let's say, inner suburb suburbs, parts of a city core. This structure is also centralized in a way, <coughs> but, uh, but um, not that dense. It's, uh, it's more di di dispersed in structure. So it is, a, let's say, a set of cities located close to each other. And they are the each of these circles are uh, are in in essence quite quite big. Here we have a decentralized but cluster structure. So um, let's say smaller um, suburbs clustered together, and then we have this structure, which is a dispersed structure. It's uh, it's still an urban community here, which is shown by these, uh, this dotted circle. 
but uh, but it's dispersed. It's, there are no clear, let's say, core of this city. So, <coughs> uh, on my trip to the U.S., <coughs> then New York City is clearly like this, and Atlanta is like this. Two two extremes, really. Uh, <coughs> and this is, uh, let's say, a bit on how it can develop from this type, which is like Fontunen's uh, the, the situation that we dealt with in, in, in the Fontunen case, with a market or a core. And then you have the, the activities, let's say agricultural activities, surrounding this, this core. And then it develops, and this this case is kind of European in in nature. The the um, this is typical development part pattern for European cities. Develop from here and into a rather strong uh, center core, and then you have the inner suburbs located quite close to this this uh, this core. Oslo is a typical example of this, this structure. Paris, London, most European cities. But then, <coughs> at one point in time, the central part here starts to get limited because of, it might simply be because of uh, spatial restrictions. Uh, again, <coughs> the Oslo, main, the main capital of Norway, has this type of problem because it's restricted by a, by a fjord, water, and by a, by a uh, <coughs> natural preservation hinterland, so it cannot expand. So then, the city starts to get more dispersed in, t in terms of that you get suburbs more distant from the city center and um, <coughs> I mean this is a situation that most cities sooner or later will uh, will uh, will face even Molde is facing this problem because Molde the city center very small and uh, rather uh, idyllic right but it is surrounded by, by um <coughs> detached houses and steep hills up to the uh, up to the up to the mountains and water. So what happens <coughs> is that we have now gotten a new suburb, rather new suburb. If you look at it, it's right up from the airport with a road leading into the city center. So not three of them, but it's, it's, uh, it's one. And w we might perhaps have two. It's also uh, um, a part of the city, a dwelling area, which is uh, located uh, rather high up in the, in on the hillside, also up from the airport, called Neubyn. There are two. And these have been Established because of uh, of the problems with uh, with space in the center, and we are about to get a third one, which is uh, right outside of this college. So the challenge is to try to balance this type of needs for space with. Both, I mean, living environment that it should be okay to 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 uh, have access to urban uh <coughs> urban qualities like uh, what you do in cities, theater, restaurants, so on, and it should be a and it is a strong stronger focus now than it used to be to to 
to have this type of transport systems that are linking the suburbs to the to the core of the city um, <coughs> and trying to avoid too much car use particularly in bigger cities to to try to uh, enhance the use of public transport is in many cases even in some American cities and I'll come back to Atlanta again because they are trying desperately to reverse the trend of uh, a strong growth in uh, in uh, in car use they're trying to reverse it uh, and it will be a very it will be a very difficult task I think to to manage that but I'll come back to that so these lines here are kind of transport systems that can link both into the city center and also link the suburbs together. So this is a typical development pat pattern in European cities. In the US, they also started from here. If you go to Dallas or to Atlanta, you will find a historic center. They call it historic center, and it's almost of that size, up to a hundred buildings, low wooden buildings. But because <coughs> of the strong focus on uh, on highway building, cars, low fuel costs, and so on, they sort of bypassed this stage and I went directly to not this stage but this stage and then a lot of lot of smaller suburbs suburbs located around it. I'll show you a map later on. So <coughs> a city spatial structure is kind of defined by the average population density in the built-up area, in the area which are, are, are built by, or uh, where house, uh, houses, blocks are, are located. Um, so we can try to define it by, let's say, the average density, uh, consumption of land per person. Density can also be measured in terms of, uh, of job, job location. number of workplaces per square kilometer, for instance. How this density is, is distributed. If you recall this uh, first slide with these dots and the four, four panel sort of table, where centralization and, uh, and clustering versus uh, dispersed structures touches upon this. And then also, <coughs> as we shall, I will show you later on, the pattern of daily trips. Both in terms of time, volume over the daytime, and with respect to the use of transport modes. So <coughs> with a low density, you will have a, the larger, the lower the density, the larger is the city built up area. And it affects the commuting distance, of course. So uh, a city that is sort of smeared out over a large, large space has a long commuting distance. And there is one other problem with cities with low density, as we shall see. Can any one of you think of a problem with low density cities and commuting? Commuting to and from work each day? Hmm? Yeah. Queues can be a problem. 
but why do you get a queuing problem in this type of uh, systems? And then I, we can limit it to queuing on the roads, right? The reason is that <coughs> when, you have a when you have a low density, it's very hard to implement or construct public transport systems that are that will be used by the public right because if you construct a, uh, a subway line for instance which are the main means for moving a lot of people during a very short period of time the walking distance to the stations will be so long that they pref people prefer to use the car instead So the density structure is, <coughs> as, a, as a rule of thumb, the easier it is to, to establish a, a good um, public transport system. In general, low densities are incompatible with transit, as I said. High densities are incompatible with private cars. But there are some in-between solutions that uh, that we will I will show you, where you might have I can go back to this. You might have this structure, which could have a rather low density, but there are con so the average density is low, but within these clusters of, let's say, urban communities, the density is high. So in such systems like this, it's possible to have the, the public transport links going to, to, to link these, uh, these uh, clusters together. So also, and th this is this is really complex. So I'm just trying to highlight a few issues and a few characteristics of of urban structures here. The labor market <coughs> is uh, a very important issue in urban development, and as we shall see in the subsequent two or three lectures i will i will uh, go quite uh, deeply into the functioning of of the labor markets not only in in urban context but quite a lot in ur in urban context because <coughs> integrated labor markets means that you have a variety of workplaces you may have many people who works with the same as you or in related businesses so it's uh, it's a way when when the labor market is integrated that means that you can choose between jobs more easily and when you can choose between jobs you might tend to shop around a bit you work three years in one place and then you move to another place without changing your address perhaps and by doing that <coughs> the learning that your competence will then also benefit let's say another employer as you try to to to, uh, to change job jobs and if a lot of people do that at least the hypothesis is that the productivity in the labor market increases. There will be a better match between your competence and the needs by the employers. And the learning effects can be stronger when people change their jobs and take their uh, skills with them to a new workplace. 
So, <coughs> and this is kind of, this is knowledge that goes back to Adam Smith, 1776, in his book, Wealth of Nations, because he then focused on the division of labor, but also on, let's say, density, and he, he also discussed trade, and the importance of having trade with, let's say, as little friction between the trade partners as possible. And what does trade have to do with labor markets? Well, it, it is um, much of the same because uh, interaction and exchange of knowledge is quite closely and theoretically quite closely related to, to, the, to movement and trade with goods. So by having increased labor market with, with modest commuting distances, this, this integration is, uh, is expected to, to become quite, uh, quite strong and, uh, and contribute to, uh, to a productivity development in, in this ur urban area. And this is kind of <coughs> the opposite situation. You've heard about Silicon Valley in California. Have any of you been there? No. Silicon Valley is, uh, is interesting because it's, um, we think about that as a bunch of companies working within uh, high-tech industries like uh, telecom, IT industries. located next door to each other, right? So that <coughs> all the intelligent people can just move freely around and, uh, and, and learn a lot and so on. Integrated labor market. But <laughs> the situation is not like that. It's quite dis dispersed. You very often need a car to get around. But they, the people there, they work of course, because they are in the industry that they are in, IT and telecom. So they work via the internet. So they integrate in a different way than many other types of, of jobs. So just to mention that distance can be, of course, physical. We talk about physical distance here, but in some industries, the information and communication technology can, can also contribute to integration even if people are, are located quite uh, distance from each other. I mean, we work in the same way here in from when we do research. I mean, I work with a guy in, uh, in Sydney. It's not exactly walking distance, but it's fully possible through, through ICT systems, but a lot of industries are dependent upon face-to-face -face contact, physical commuting and so on. And um, so I think it's still valid even if you, can, if you can find exceptions. Because if you go to Silicon Valley tomorrow and remember back to this lecture and think, what was he talking about? Because here we don't exactly work next door, but still it's a very pro productive industry, industrial region. And the reason is that uh, you can substitute physical movements with electronics in, in some industries. So the la large labor markets are really, really important. And uh, <coughs> we, uh, we have made, we made a study a couple of years ago uh, in, the, in the Oslo Fjord area how would the integrated labor markets look like in the future? And that was the future that was then up to 2050. Uh, and how should, should we try to design the transport network to strengthen the integration of the labor market in that area? Um, 
Well, I think I have a map of the Oslo area. I'll come back to that. But the reason for that project was that there are quite a lot of cities with between 30 and 100,000 people, uh, which connects to, to Oslo, the main capital, with uh, I think around 600,000 people via rail network. And the rail network is, uh, is not very strong. Very little. There are some double tracks, but, uh, but mostly single track uh, rail. And it takes quite a lot of time to move between those smaller cities and Oslo. And we were asked to say something about what will happen if, if we get a, a more, let's say, high speed rail network where you can bring all these cities within one hour commuting distance to Oslo. What will happen? Um, <coughs> in some parts of the world, we have this migration flow going towards the larger cities. Because, of course, to get work, and people are, are uh, actually suffering quite a bit from that, because they, they end up in, let's say, less favorable living con conditions in many cases. Um, and many of them actually has to commute quite a lot to get to the workplaces which are in the central business district in many cases. Um, you remember this uh, bid rent curves with the functional distribution of uh, activities, where we had this, let's say in, in Europe, this uh, pre Second World War situation where you have low income groups living very quite close to the city center. Uh, and that was because they couldn't afford private cars. And there are certain similarities in this, uh, in this situation when we consider, let's say, big cities in developing economies even today. We see this pattern. Um, I, ne I need to write up something here. <coughs> a professor at, at Harvard <coughs> has, uh, has written a book quite recently which is called Triumph of the city. And for those of you who are really interested or gain interest in this topic of urban development, I recommend this book. It's, uh, <coughs> it's quite easy to read. <coughs> and uh, when you are done with this course, you will find a lot of the theories that we are going to go through, through the remaining parts of the course embedded in his, uh, in his texts. Because he's using the framework from Fontaine, from uh, Alonso Millsmith, this uh, bit rent curves. He will use Myrdal, he will use a couple of other people that I will, I will uh, tell you about later on in, in this text. <coughs> and one thing that he says, which might be rather, sound rather cynical, is that a very strong asset for large cities in the developing world are the slums where the pe poor people live. Lots, there can be lots of them, right? You know what a slum is, right? So he says, this is a 
strong opportunity for the, those cities to, to get, uh, get a very strong growth in the, in the not too distant future. Can you imagine why it says that? You have a lot of people, poor people, and he says that if you implement then education programs, housing programs, social security systems, transport systems, you have a lot of human resources that are, they are not idle today, but the potential is huge for education and, uh, and increased productivity. So there will be, so what he then points at is a theory that is called endogenous growth, which we will talk about during the lecture right after uh, Easter, where we have a kind of internal structure that can, can give uh, a strong potential for growth by building upon the human resources that you have at hand. I mean, if a person is, uh, I mean, if a city is populated with people with PhDs, right? The potential for growth is hopefully there, but it's easy to see that the, the potential is even larger. If you have a, a, a large population with low education, because uh, at least quite a lot of them will be fully able to, to get their bachelor's, master's or whatever, and, and hence hopefully become more productive. So <coughs> um, the picture may look not too good in, in, in many cases. Uh, in some cities around the globe, the slums are located not very close to the city center, but it is way out in the, in the, in the outskirts. And in those cases, the problems are, are, uh, are, um, are stronger because it's much more difficult to, to establish the link between them the workplaces and the places that people live. But if the city is dense and you have these, these uh, let's say, inner suburbs of, uh, of, of poor people within the core of the city, it's easier to, to, to uh, take out this, uh, this potential. Have any of you been to South Africa? I was at uh, <coughs> I was in Johannesburg, on the outs outskirts of Johannesburg, some eight years back, and uh, do you know of a car called Toyota Hiace? It can take up to eight people, I think, or perhaps twelve. Um, it's a van and the public transport system there consisted of mainly such Toyota Hiaces, sh uh, shuttling people to and from the city center. And in, uh, in this, in Norway, a Toyota Hiace looks some approximately like this, right? It's a box with four wheels. In Johannesburg, the Hiace looked like this, still with four wheels because of overload and it was an extreme amount of people that can be transported in the highest I think I counted yeah, on the roof and inside um, but the point is that 
The city there is so dispersed that it is very hard to achieve and to perhaps to to uh, to uh, let's say use this potential because of the dispersed uh, urban structure. This is uh, <coughs> a map of some some cities with varying uh, types of, of density. Shanghai is uh, is uh, one of the extremes here, very dense with uh, with a fairly decent uh, public transport system as well. New York <coughs> is very mixed. It has it is a combination of a dispersed car-based urban system and a very dense. Uh, this is Manhattan, New York, a very and this is Brooklyn. It's a very dense system, and even this is a part of this dense system with uh, with good good public transport. London <coughs> is somewhere in between, and this guy he says that one of the largest problems with some of the older European cities. is that they have some regulations. Could you imagine, if you look at this picture of London as compared to Shanghai, what the problem might be? The height of the buildings. In London, more or less everywhere, the maximum number of, uh, of stories is four. four flo uh, three floors, right? That is the maximum. And you have some exceptions. So, we, so uh, he says that, well, uh, Glacier says that if you don't break those rules or remove them, some of the traditionally quite dense European cities will start to sprawl because of the limitations for building in the in the city center. Manhattan, New York <coughs> is kind of interesting in that respect because they have solved this problem of preservation in a very nice way, I think. Because they say that, I'm simplifying a bit, but it's not too far from the truth. They say that the small, low buildings at the corners of each blocks, quartal in Norwegian, they should be preserved. And then you can do whatever you want, almost, elsewhere in this block. So what you typically see is that you have skyscrapers or tall buildings. And then you have the small, low, perhaps not more than four floors, the corners. And that, that may be buildings from 1920 and even before that. So it's a nice trade-off between preservation and development. And because of the limited space, of course, the, the, the house is becomes quite 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 tall in that in that area. Berlin has some of the same problem as, as London with respect to to limitations, regulations, and uh, hence the tendency to sprawl is uh, is there. We'll see a uh, we see a kind of structure in the sprawl. Uh, corridors, and I'll come back to that, the, the nice features of corridors when you talk about urban development. We had this last time. Um, this uh, this uh, ring road structure, which may uh, may connect suburbs 
in a nice way. Even nicer if you have a uh, a uh, subway connecting these uh, these uh, nodes here. More environment, uh, more energy friendly in that way. But this is a typical structure. Um, might be nice, but it might also cause some problems if the city center is isn't strong enough to, let's say, cope with the establishment of the secondary centers. We have one city in this county which suffers from this. It's not, uh, they don't have a ring road. It's too small for that, but they have secondary centers. Uh, some 10, 20 kilometers outside of the city center. It's Olsen. They have uh, <coughs> they have gotten a suburb around a big mall, shopping center, and the uh, core of the city, the the historic center, is it's not entirely dead, but not far from it. And the reason for that is that the town planners was asleep when they decided, or some property developer decided to big this, build this big shopping mall. That is one explanation. Another explanation, which is a kind of a subset of the first one, is that if there are different jurisdictions, different communes, handling the development issues. Like for instance, this may be one commune, and this may be another one. Then these guys here, they might want to attract this big mall. They don't care about uh, the neighboring commune and the, and, the, and the historic center there. So they say, fine, come to us, we'll provide you with cheap land and whatever. And then you get some nasty external effects here. You drain out activity from a, let's say, a, a good, well-functioning city center and out to the outskirts. So it's a coordination problem as well, connected to, to urban development. Because they may have different agendas. And that may be a reason why it might be good to merge communes together and to let the city take care of everything that happens in the, also in the, in, the, in the outskirts. That has happened here. Used to be at least two communes, which, were, which was merged to one. And, uh, and a lot of uh, such merges has happened in, in many Norwegian cities. But you, you get my point. There may be different incentives in the center and from the people that have, uh, that decides upon land use patterns at the outskirts. Actually, the <coughs> Norwegian government banned the establishment of uh, big shopping malls in, in uh, distant from the city centers at one point in time, in the 1990s. But that ban has partly been lifted. So now they say that, well, you can, but you need to have a, a very thorough assessment of the consequences before you are allowed to, uh, to, to, to build such shopping centers. Yeah, OK. I think we break there. <laughs>